first of all, thank you all very much for coming. And uh, you know, I think this is a, a, something new for Magic Bus that we're trying to sort of engage. Trying to engage uh, really people who have supported Magic Bus, who have been sort of part of our sort of our guests, you know, some of our key relationships to really engage in a sort of quite a meaningful discussion. It's also the first time I'll ever stand up in front of you and ask you for money. So we better, uh, better <laughs> get used to this. Um, you know, at Magic Bus, we've, 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 we're really sort of evolving now from doing the good work that we do, but really starting to understand how we advocate better to the government and try and create some big legal changes in education and, and livelihood. Um, and so we started this journey really uh, trying to sort of understand it in depth, really, what, how we approach these, 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 these issues. And we thought what would be a great idea is to take the people who have supported Magic Bus on that journey with us. And so tonight is that kickoff event. And I think we probably could not have had a better, uh, better set of speakers um, and presenters to, to, to kick this off with. And I, I'm so happy to have um, Harsh Munda, who's, who's, I know most of you know his work. He's written 12 books. Um, his most prolific being Post of Gujarat Riots, and then more recently, uh, the book that really stimulated Magic Bus is this, the book called Looking Away, which is really a, a very insightful view on just how we've marginalized the poor, uh, people living on the margins even more than they have been, and really how the middle class, us, the upper class, whatever we prefer, to refer ourselves to, have really almost normalized the state of poverty in this country. So this is, a, uh, I think, what you said was great. This is an opportunity to look in the mirror and have that discussion. Asking the questions is Abba. I'm sure all of you know Abba. She's, she's the senior uh, correspondent at uh, Bloomberg, or the, the senior editor of Bloomberg. She's been a journalist for 10 years. So this is, a, uh, I think, what you said was great. This is an opportunity to look in the mirror and have that discussion. Asking the questions is Abba. I'm sure all of you know Abba. Things that I think most characterize uh, 
legitimization of prejudice. Uh, substantially in the middle classes to which I and all of us belong. Uh, and then finally I try in my book to make a case for what I call public compassion uh, uh, as the way forward. But, but firstly about inequality within the uh, no Chomsky was uh, is, is when he came to Delhi, in fact, a couple of years ago, he said uh, in an interview, he said, I've never seen a country where all of these so dramatically manifest in your face, but also a country where people have developed this extraordinary capacity to look away, uh, as he has seen in India. Uh, and, 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 it's, and, and, and therefore, what I what, what I've tried to write about in my book is not, not the facts of inequality so much, but a normative framework in which we have come to believe that this inequality is, uh, is at least inevitable, if not actually justified and, 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 and worthwhile. And I, I try to trace it to, you know, I, I, I think that three normative frameworks within which I see our middle class which I belong to. Uh, three not not one but three normative frameworks will justify it or influence influence us. The first is the idea of caste, and many of us might say where is caste? But caste to me is ultimately the idea that accident of where you are born determines the rest of your life. What kind of whether you'll be, will be able to study, what kind of education you get, how far you'll be able to study, what kind of jobs are open to you is determined simply by the fact. I, I I teach a course on poverty and inequality like this semester at the IM and the bar. I accepted that a few years ago. And one of the first things I, I tell my young students, uh, and I might say that to all of us in this room, uh, that I tell them that none of us are in this room because we are the best. Uh, we are in this room. Uh, because a billion people didn't get the life chances that we got. And, and, and we forget that so easily. So, so, so what, we, what we see as our due is actually, uh, is actually, uh, is our privilege. And we don't recognize the difference between those. So first is the idea of caste, and it plays out in many ways to talk about. The second is the British idea of class, which we've also absorbed, so the whole idea of Good families being associated with you know, culture and wealth and so on, and the poor being sort of a poorish, uh, uncultured sort of mass out there, very different from us. Uh, and but the third, and I think what makes this mix particularly toxic, uh, is a third idea that has over the last 25, 30 years, and that is the idea, the neoliberal idea that like that greed is good. And why should I be ashamed of, uh, you know, uh, uh, ashamed of making money and spending it? So there was actually, at least when I was growing up, there was a certain uh, a culture where uh, it was vulgar to, you know, uh, to throw about your your money and you know, sh to flash your wealth, etc. People would, uh, I mean, uh, Azim Premji's uh, wife was once. Uh, mentioning when I was talking about this, she said that uh, like when she was a child, her parents just 
insisted that she would be joining a car to school, but she feels so embarrassed that she gets the car park two blocks away and walk pretending that she's also walking to school. Today, you, our kids would flash how expensive their car is. And there's something something that has happened along the way. Uh, but, but there's also, you know, uh, somebody else uh, also, uh, person called Akhil Gupta, he asked a question about how many people die in India every year of completely preventable causes. And just because they don't have enough food or, or, or clean water or that okay. And he came to a very conservative figure of 2 million people. Now, to put that figure in perspective, it's the number of people who died in the Great Bengal famine of that particularly 3 million. So we are actually seeing playing out uh, something like you know, the Great Bengal famine happening around us, among us, uh, and it doesn't didn't even notice. So I think, I think that's that's really right. it. So Harsh, what do you think has caused the, the lack of empathy, as, as you like to call it? I mean, a few other statistics that are in your book, when we take a look at uh, uh, philanthropic efforts, for instance, around the world, um, look at what Mark Zuckerberg did just, in fact, earlier this week. I mean, however you want to uh, break down how he's spending his money, regardless. Um, at, you know, India actually has percentage-wise, the least amount of, uh, in terms of what millionaires actually do end up giving away, the percentage is the least. So why is that? What is it about the social structure or what is it about this, um, you know, greed is good culture that's seeping in uh, and, and making this happen? Yeah, I mean, that, I, I think that, that that's really what, what I'm trying to understand. Uh, one of the things that spurred, and many things spurred this book, but uh, but one of them is, is that I work with uh, homeless street kids over several years. And it strikes me, see, it strikes me that, uh, see, a, a, you know, a, a, a child who's dying of malnutrition in the jungles, a tribal child, somebody at least whom you can block out and, uh, you know, we've exiled the poor, and I, I, I think, from our conscience and our consciousness. Uh, you know, at least if you've grown up in the film of the 50s and 60s, you saw poor people uh, in your films, they you know, saw farmers start to their land, you saw homeless people. Today, if you look at our films, you can imagine there are no poor people. So we, uh, you know, watch our television, watch our newspapers, etc. So we, we've in a sense, only poor people, we, you know, our children who are meeting today is people whose job is to serve you. Uh, and, uh, uh, I, I, again, I, 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 among many other things, I try to teach young, speak with young people because I feel it's important to have these conversations. So in St. Stephen's, which was my old college, uh, I, I, uh, I was talking and I just asked kids, how many of you have been, a, been in a slum? And zero hands went down. It was a class of people. So I put stuff and I said, how many of you have at least seen a slum? And less than half the hands went up, which means, means that you cannot live in Delhi and not see a slum every day, but that it doesn't register to you at all. So when I when working with these kids and uh, and you see that they, they did you escape the worst kind of cruelty and so on, and and, and and you see them, you're coming back from home maybe at night, you uh, you, know, you, put, you put your own daughter to bed, uh, with, you know, giving her everything that, that, that money can buy and more. And it doesn't worry you at that moment, and it's a cold, freezing night, and it doesn't worry you that a kilometer away is another little girl just her age who would have found her food in a base place down the pool. No, these kids tell, tell me that you, you, you don't cover yourself at night. Many of them don't cover themselves at night because it's an invitation to uh, And they uh, they give uh, themselves to the night. Uh, she sort of get up at four in the morning and, uh, and, 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 and look for ways that she can see the inside of school. That one kilometer that separates my child from that child is the longest distance in the world. Neither will cross this. And all that my child has done, or your children, or we have done, is we've chosen our parents wisely. Uh, there's nothing else that we've really done which entitles us to what we have. But, uh, you know, uh, you. Where, where have we, what, 
think along the way, empathy in particular is getting extinguished. Uh, and inequality, we teach inequality without realizing it. So when you, in, uh, uh, you tell a four-year-old, I mean, I also think, just tell a four-year-old child, get us a baron ke paoncho. How does he know at that age that sab baron mein the domestic help is not included? And that this is one adult that you can talk to disrespectfully, uh, that you can, uh, you know, you can command. And the child learns pretty quickly. There's a, you know, I was speaking at uh, New York University on homelessness a uh, couple of years back, and uh, there's a wonderful professor with me, and he asked a very interesting, he said that, he, you know, after I spoke, he said that he's been teaching at NYU for uh, 30 years. One question he asks his students is that, after when you drive through New York, you see homeless people, and as a child, you see things, that something is really basically wrong. So, how did your parents explain this to you? How did they introduce you to the homeless? And he said that uh, the most striking thing that, that he, the kids remember, they remember many things, is, is, you know, like you take the child and you sort of protect the child, like those are dangerous people out there. But, uh, but when I started asking the same question then to young people here, most of us don't even have a memory. See, and here the distress should be much greater because the child is seeing another child exactly her age, you know, knocking on the window, uh, you know, sleeping uh, in under the window. It should naturally cause you extraordinary amount of distress. I, I think that, that what we teach our children is to not do. And we teach that very, very early so that there is no distress. So, that, so I think, we, you know, the way empathy is unlearned. I believe that empathy is, and one more big, big thing that I'd like to say, it, why has it changed over the years also? Is that, uh, Arundhati Roy says many things that, that perhaps I feel, you know, my, my feel is a little over the top, but one of the nicest things that I read, read uh, about what she said is that, she said there are many secession movements in this country. We know about the Marx, we know about the Northeast, but she said there's been only one truly successful secession movement in our country. And that is the secession of the middle class from the rest of India. So we built our gated colonies, we built our fancy air conditioned schools, we got our malls, uh, where we shop, we, uh, you know, so, so you think we don't use public transport. In the way, at least when we were growing up, the cinema was a common place, the public transport was something that everybody used, etc., etc. So I think we constructed a world in which the only poor people our children encounter are people whose job is to serve them. They don't see them as human beings. And empathy, I would like to emphasize, is, is first an act of imagination. What, uh, and what would it like, be like to be a homeless child? What would be, it be like to be living in a, a slum? With where I have to defecate in the open and where I have to bathe in the open and, and so on and so forth. First, it's that act of imagination, and then it's an act of feeling. I think the imagination has been completely you know, destroyed by the separateness, also Hindu Muslim. Thank you. I'm going to come back to that that debate in, in just a moment. But I actually want to would want to bring in the audience here because I think a lot of us are guilty of living in a bubble, whether we realize it or not. Everyone's brought up, I think, in this in this culture where we all do think of ourselves as incredibly moral-minded, ethical, and caring. And yet, Harsha's right. To a large extent, we go from our offices to our air-conditioned cars, homes, uh, malls, and and don't actually experience. Uh, you know what a large section of the society is going through, and and are sort of oblivious to it for the large part. So I just want to get a sense of what is the first thing that comes to mind when you think of it. I mean, as a reaction as to okay, why am I not, you know, feeling more compelled to perhaps address this in in a perhaps in a more aggressive way than just I don't know than you know every yes everyone does their bit sometimes. Of course, I'm not I'm, I'm not doubting that. But you know, just just in simple things and everyday things, and in the in the conversations yeah. we have with our children, I think that's to me the most important. Yeah. So thank you, Harsha. That was uh, 
absolutely brilliant. I'm, I'm very happy to be sitting here listening uh, to you. I have a question that maybe a bit counter, which is, have you seen any societies in which the norm does not play a marginalizing role? Any society where the distance with, with inequality is not marginalized? And, and what have you, and if so, what can we learn from that? I think that's a great, that's a great question. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm at the same ask uh, a very really interesting question in, that, in the book called The Idea of Justice, towards the end. It's not what the book is about, but it's a fascinating question. The question he asks is, every human society, uh, through history and through geography, has been characterized by injustice. But every human society, through history and geography, has also been characterized by people resisting and fighting injustice and trying to make the world a more just place. And the question that he asks, it, it's, it's a very profound question. He says, why, what is it in human nature that makes resisting injustice universal to the human experience? And the answer he gives is, 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 is fascinating. He says, the first is the quality of empathy. Our capacity to feel the pain of others, but I, I, I would add our capacity first to imagine the pain of others and then feel it. The second, he said, is the quality of reason. So you feel the pain and then you ask why. And the third, he says, is the love of freedom. And I believe that someday we'll have to start, you know, what has happened to us. I think we'll have to struggle with questions about where have all of these gone. And let me give you an extreme example about it. I, I'll give you a couple of them, I think, that might help illustrate. The first is the Gujarat Kani. Uh, there was uh, uh, there was a journalist called Ashish Khaitna who, uh, who actually uh, went in a few years later trying to understand what happened you know, in people's minds and hearts. How could they do this? And he pretended to be a sympathizer. He joined uh, the Baganda and stayed with them for six months and recorded uh, conversations. If you see them, they're still online, I think. But the one that I find most terrifying is this conversation where you see uh, this guy called Suresh Richard sitting, and in the picture, you see his wife sitting next to him, and he's describing how he raped Muslim women and part of them. And his wife is nodding in a thesis. Now, to my mind, that represents the ultimate, you know, where he can appreciate her husband raping and killing another woman, only when she doesn't see a Muslim woman any longer as a woman. You know, and I think, I think that's, that's to me one example, and that might see, seem an extreme example. But I think there's not much this difference when we see a middle class home where when you have a child working alongside your own child, so one child gets everything, and the other child uh, carries the books and, 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 and sweeps the floors and cleans the toilets. I think there's the, the, you know, the way that we have that other child is no longer in your mind and heart a child like my own. So you've you've done that same kind of journey. The third that thing, that example that I'd like to give is, you know, December 16th happened in Delhi. Uh, as all of us know. And uh, to me, it was a very special moment in our collective history. It was a rare moment of public empathy. It was a moment because, see, here's a, a woman whose name we didn't know, whose face we don't know, uh, whose pain we felt collectively as our own. I remember the day that she died, I'd also gone to the protest site. And there were these young people who were sitting mourning like some, like their own you know, sister or friend or uh, has died. And that is very special. But it also reminded me about the limits of other people. Because working with homeless people, it teaches you many things. Uh, I, I remember the you know, first homeless shelter we set up for, for women. Uh, they, uh, I asked them what's changed most in your life. And they said, one of the women put up her hand and said, for the first time in 17 years, uh, have I, you know, can I close my eyes at night and be sure that no one leaves me through the night? And you see, 
as a man, I perhaps will never be able to understand. But even the women in this room, one incident of that kind would scar you for life. Imagine living a life, and they tell, tell me, you know, you, see, so they take any kind of most useless, violent, uh, drug abusing homeless man as a partner only because it gives you some kind of protection. But they say if you lie next to this man, and you know, you might have a plastic sheet over you, and they slash the plastic sheet, and somebody will rape you. And uh, in front of this man, and nobody, no policeman is going to listen to you, etc. Et so, where would we ever think of a candlelight march for those homeless women, or the women in Gujarat, or you know, when you go to the northeast, you, you saw this case where Manorma uh, was uh, raped and killed by security forces. At the protest, I don't know if you all remember, uh, the 40, 50 English women went and stood in front of the army barracks and stripped off their clothes naked and said, rape us, as you know, to express their anguish. Where is our sharing of that pain? And, and so I think that, that there's, you know, the, the expression of empathy is enormous, but I have not really fully answered your question. I do think things have never been perfectly, but even in our own histories, take, take one cultural form like the Langar, and I've talked about it here. The Langar to me is a, you know, it was started by the Sufis in Nizamdi and uh, in, in Delhi itself, and then Gujarat uh, Shikita. It's not just a food charity. I mean, one part of it is, is wonderful because it, it's a food charity where everybody contributes food and labor and, and, and so on and breaks uh, many boundaries doing that. But I think the most special thing about the cultural idea of the Langar is that you have to treat the person whom you are keep offering food like an honor person. You have to sit them down, you have to uh, you know you have to give them respect. And it's such a beautiful idea and you have to eat with them. Now this is a 12th century and a 16th century kind of idea. Working with the homeless today, we decided to do a small ethnography kind of thing with the homeless about food charities, religious food charities in Delhi today. Just seeing our own society through their eyes. It was very, very instructive. They said, A, uh, you know, the uh, we were really shocked that there was not a single Christian food charity in India. And I've written about this, it led to a lot of debate and the archbishop, etc. But they haven't still started. Uh, now, then we, uh, the Hindu one, very interesting from their point of view, they said the problem with Hindu food charity is that they will give on you know, Saturdays and Tuesdays, they'll give you some oily, sweet stuff. But we don't need that oily food, sweet stuff. We want wholesome food served on a regular basis with dignity. But who's bothered about uh, what we need? Then, interesting what they have to give rather than what we need. And I thought that was a very good thing. Then the sick one, and I happen to be born in a sick family, uh, it really caused me enormous pain because they told me that all the major gurdwaras in, in Delhi are now blocking out the district. They don't allow them in. Uh, and, uh, and to me it's a complete subversion of the whole idea. Uh, and uh, so I wrote about this and and interestingly, some of my uncles are on the committees of these Gurdwaras, etc. So they called me and they said, you, you caused us so much shame and you've written this. So I said, I cause you shame by writing it or by you are doing this. He said, you don't understand. You know, these poor people who come in, uh, uh, they, uh, they drink, they, they take drugs, they smoke, uh, they dirty. So they defile the temple. That's why we keep them out. I said, I have only one question to ask you. Well, the poor different in Guru Nanak's time. And if he felt that they don't defile the temple, what's happened to us today? Uh, uh, Tusitas wrote, uh, in, in, you, you know, he wrote in common people's language, the Brahmins were against him, and he was persecuted about. So he writes a very beautiful Doha, which is translated largely as saying, What you like to me, I'll beg for my food, and I'll sleep in the mosque. Now, the mosque was a place where people of of different faiths in the destitute and homeless were welcomed in. I work with the homeless in Dhamma Masjid and you know which has the largest concert center and I cannot you know stop looking up and seeing the great Dhamma Masjid mosque there and saying 
you know, this, I mean, this is where they should have been. So I think we all collectively eroded uh, ideas of, 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 of egalitarian, compassionate giving and empathy that, that, that were even part of our tradition, even within feudal setups. And if, if these could happen in the 15th century, in the 12th century, what about 21st century Republican in India? Uh, you know, what's happening to us? A lot of questions, sir. I, I, I think that you raise a lot of important points. Um, a few things that I wanted to get your perspective on. One is we also grew up in an era where we're told where it's in a standard millionaire era, right? So we're told where if you give the child who's knocking on your window 20 rupees, that's furthering uh, the problem, okay? Um, we also have, I think, actually a growing awareness among various strata of society as they get into more wealth. I actually feel that there is a growing awareness about the haves and the have-nots, and there are, are more people who are willing to give to the have-nots, whether they do, they're domestic workers or in a bigger fashion. Um, I think that education actually of the growing middle class and the uh, and the have-nots has a huge will have a huge impact on trying to solve this problem. Are there any other uh, things that you come across while you have been researching and talking to people about this? Are there any other measures that one can do? Because magic path, I feel, is on a path to really helping to solve the education part of it along with other NGOs. Um, so are there any other initiatives that you have come across that would be worthwhile exploring? I just want to add to that, actually. I think that while while there are a lot of, has and have a lot more growing awareness, uh, as, as you described, um, how do you bridge the class barrier? Uh, you know, and because that only seems to be getting wider. So even if, even if today you have Attempts to you know to do your bit people that are reaching out helping donating including but there's still definitely that barrier that still exists Firstly the strong stun dog story uh, I you know and, and, and the stun dog is not unique in that you know this idea that that you know if you give to this child their, their gangs and, 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 and all of this it's substantially a middle class fantasy to justify our not giving. I work with homeless children uh, in, in six, seven cities now for the last 10 years, and we haven't encountered a single criminal gang yet. Uh, children on the streets substantially for very different reasons. Uh, there's one segment of children who, who are clearly running away from extremely abusive family situations. Uh, so girls talk about being raped by their fathers, boys talk about you know, violent fathers beating up their mothers, etc. And there's a spirit that a street child has, I've seen this all over the world now, which self selects. So these are kids who, uh, at the age of six or eight, when we couldn't even cross the road alone, decide they have had enough and I'm going to build my own life. And they move out and they. So that's a major reason why kids are on the streets. Another major reason is that their mothers themselves are homeless, who have been driven out by uh, extreme domestic violence, etc. They, a lot of these children are children of rape, uh, of these mothers, uh, and, and so on. And then you also have families, and, 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 and families come out of different set of reasons. I mean, if there's any coercion to beg on the streets, it's largely by families. So are you saying that we should be giving those kids that we see knocking on the street? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I'm saying that it's a, see, it's a complicated question because each of us have to make, make a choice. I made, made an easier choice by deciding to work with them. But that's not obviously uh, a general uh, solution. Don't look down on them, I think is, is one. Uh, see that child as a human being. Uh, definitely engage and you know you can carry food for instance if you feel like, but I think that, that's more substantial, etc. But I think it has to link to something much larger, which is the idea of a good society, the idea of, of social protection. And, and the idea of a good state. That doesn't just explain. I mean, this same thing taking you to something like that. Uh, to me, the idea of social protection, uh, you know, by the state is ultimately 
again what Chomsky somewhere said, is the idea that we should take care of each other. The idea of a social welfare state is the idea that we should take care of each other. He goes on to say, however we live in times where this is considered an extremely dangerous and subversive idea, the idea that we should take care of each other. It needs to be crushed at all costs. So I have been speaking about compassion, I've been writing the time and I've called it. At that time it was considered very really unradical. Today you're seen as some kind of you know left loony radical because you're talking about building a compassionate state in a compassionate society. So I, to my answer, it's much more about recognizing the kind of state you need to build. Who did this state a little more? Uh, uh, the idea, you know, what is public compassion to me? Public compassion to me, firstly, I, I talk about egalitarian compassion. A compassion not about you being here and somebody being down there and you're sort of making that person the recipient of your uh, giving. It's about recognizing our intrinsic equality. So when you see a, a, a homeless, mentally ill woman with matted hair and a mind gone and you know, covered with crying, naked and covered with a speaker, can we recognize that intrinsically in her dignity, there's no difference between her and my mother and yours. My mother could have been there if she had life treated her differently. She could have been where my mother is if life treated her differently. So I think that to me, A, recognizing the intrinsic equal human dignity of all people. B, the idea then of, of, of solidarity, uh, of uh, what, you know, uh, our constitution actually talks about three things, liberty, equality, and fraternity. We forget fraternity. We've lost it completely. Fraternity to me, the, the Hindi, actually, uh, the Hindi uh, version of the constitution actually uses a very beautiful word for fraternity, which is bandhuta. Bandhuta, the idea you know, an ideology built on, on friendship that we share with each other, uh, the idea that we belong with each other. That is what, what, I, what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm, and so whether you give or not is, is part of something bigger, it's about also what you teach your children, etc. But to me, the bigger idea is, is this idea that we need, we must take care of each other. And finally, you know, I, I was in the National Advisory Council and I was responsible for drafting uh, some of the acts, which a lot of people are very angry about, like the Food Security Act. I was, uh, you know, and since I had, uh, it, you know, I, uh, I came in the group that was drafting it, when it came to Parliament, I found there was, in, even in the entire political class, there was almost nobody who was actually out there defending it with, uh, so I was finding myself in front of television studios every night trying to talk and everybody was angry including the anchor and not just and I'm not just talking about the anchor that you all think would be angry even other <laughs> uh, everybody was angry and, and finally somebody articulated she was uh, uh, a well-known industrialist who actually who normally is quite sober and in this conversation she suddenly got very angry and she said I've had enough what's wrong with the fact that I've made so much money I worked hard to make my money I've done nothing to harm the economy. Why should I be taxed to feed the poor? And to my mind, you know, if, if there's something that spurred the idea of education, you know, because that, that one we lost, that one national television, you're saying, why should I be taxed to feed the poor? So my reply was that the poor work hard, you would agree, much harder. They've done even less to harm the economy. And in a good society, people of wealth should be happy to share some of it. So that is a better life. Yes. So can I just counter that? Yes, please. And, and, hi. Um, I totally agree. And by the way, I would argue that I think there's a tremendous amount of empathy, not just in this room, but amongst most of the classes. I think you have to have a heart of stone to not feel for the way that people suffer in this country. Whether it's the tribals who end up taking up arms and you know and become Maoists or whatever it is. So I mean, I would just maybe disagree with the empathy factor. I think you also have to look at the historical context of India, right? So most of us probably are, I would say I don't know most of the people in this room, we've come up in a context where this country, you know, was socialist, quote unquote, taxed up the wazoo. We all worked very hard. Most of us maybe have uh, our products of either, you know, government servants, backgrounds or whatever it is and made something of ourselves. 
So that's the kind of historical background that you come from. I don't know about the industrialists in particular, but the point is that lots of people have worked really hard in spite of all the hurdles that have been put in their way by a system that is controlled by the government, that does tax, that does indirect tax and corruption, all the rest of it. So it's actually really hard to make a living in this country. And so then when you get when it gets turned around and you are then told that, you know, and these are the fat cats who are running the country who have made a lot of money out of the largest of, you know, whatever corporates or whatever it is, and then they turn around and say, right to food, right to this. Nobody wants anybody to go hungry. I mean, you know, nobody's a jerk. Nobody wants somebody to not have the opportunity for an education. Nobody does not want to have somebody to have, you know, medical insurance and all the rest of it. We don't want India to be like this. But my counterpoint is when we have all come up and, you know, I'm 42 years old. I grew up in the 1970s and 80s. I know what India was all about. How do you then take that context and then you have something that's being, you know, uh, percolated down Thank because you. the government decides. How do you how do you counter that? This is, I think, where you get the counter argument. It's I, not the lack of empathy. It's because we have been told because of socialism we were taxed ninety percent or whatever. How do you turn that around? I think the point is also yeah, to, to yeah. <laughs> just taking off from the today. I'm at the risk of sounding quite unpopular. The point today is that the country with the food and the education bills and the CSR, which is now compulsory unless you have a valid excuse. Do you not think that the government, in a sense, is compulsorily passing the buck on to the private sector? Yes, I agree. As a private individual, as a private company, it is my duty, but is it really a statutory duty that I have to and I'm forced to obey and follow? Because what really seems to be happening is that the government, because of corruption, is not really exactly is passing the so, yeah. it's not so, spending so, the money that it gets on your taxes. Where it should be. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think I, so, so, <laughs> I think let's get some facts here yeah. in this. Uh, let's get some facts here. India's tax to GDP ratio is one of the lowest in the world. Uh, we are about 14 to 16 percent. Even the US, even the US, with its full free market, is about 24 percent. Countries like Brazil uh, are about 36 percent. Uh, so, so we are taxing very, very little compared to most of the world. We are world champions, as Dr. Sandra said. We are world champions of social understanding. So let I mean, just please hear me out. These are facts. Okay. Second, uh, subsidies to the to the rich and the middle class are at least three times or more to the subsidies that the poor get, and we don't recognize it. We don't get outraged by it. But every time you turn on your SUV, you switch on your air conditioned uh, air conditioner, we all live on uh, the subsidies of the poor are actually up, up at least a third of what the rich get. Uh, so that, that's a second fact. Third is that we have, in this secession from the rest of India, we have opted out of government schools, of government hospitals. We have our own. We figured out, you know, uh, we figured out. Uh, how we can live independently of public, uh, you know, supported basic services, and we think that's fine. But imagine if you were at the other end of the spectrum, and when when a, a public school doesn't function or a public uh, hospital doesn't function, uh, who does it hit the most? It hits. It doesn't hit us because we we've succeeded. We've created our own systems. Uh, the idea that we are taxing ourselves too much is, is a complete figment, figment of the language. We are taxing ourselves the least, and, and the majority of our tax, one more fact, is mostly indirect tax. We have a much higher proportion of indirect taxes compared to direct taxes, and indirect taxes are largely on the, you know, the poor are much more in terms of the proportion of their, uh, their income. They are taxed far more than the richer, and the super rich are taxed very, very little. Uh, you know, just take one example 
uh, and th these are these are just factual situations, and, and uh, how we relate with it, 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 it is up, up to us. Uh, to, 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 yes, there are two things that I'd like to say. One is that just I mean just to give an example of subsidies, uh, we all know that when the Tatars were facing this terrible problem in in, in, in West Bengal and they shifted to Gujarat and set up the the small car factory. Uh, it was only through an RTI application that people got to know what were the terms. Now I'll tell you the terms. Whether that those terms were, you know, uh, whether they are appropriate or not is something that we have to decide. But these are different. They are political questions. They are ethical questions. Uh, the terms were that uh, Tatas was investing some X amount. Three X was given from public funds. At 0.1% rate of interest, repayable after 20 years, uh, plus you know free land, free electricity, this, that, and the other. Uh, CSE has calculated that 50% of the cost of that small car was public subsidy. Gujarat, on the other hand, then is about 16th or 17th or 18th in, in, you know, in terms of its spending on health and education. Now, I'm not saying that somebody is venal and evil. There is exactly an ideology that you are not talking about. That the state has not been able to deliver. The state is corrupt. The state is thoughtful. The state is inefficient. Therefore, uh, you know, let let markets function. They create wealth. They create jobs. Everybody will be better off. And uh, by you know going down the path of the socialist evil socialist path that we had. Uh, uh, you know, they take more taxes, and that will all go into corruption. That there's a whole way of thinking around that. But the last fact that I would like to say is that no country in the world, no country in the world, has achieved sustainable high levels of economic growth on such an unequal foundation as India has done. Every one of those countries, which you look at, whether you look at South Korea, you look at China, you look at uh, these others, first ensured. Universal education uh, of a high quality, public funded. What about Bangladesh and some of our okay, yeah, yeah. better indicators? Yeah, I, I'll explain about Bangladesh as well. Uh, Bangladesh has actually done much better in terms of social spending than, 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 than we are. Uh, so, uh, Bangladesh has done better, Sub Saharan Africa has done better. Uh, in, 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 uh, that's precisely my point. I just want to. So, so let, yeah. let, let, so let yeah. me say, so, uh, uh, so I, I'm getting lost, but the point is that all of these countries went in for at least three things. One was universal, uh, good quality education and universal health care for all. Uh, before, because you have to build, you have to build your, you know, market and economic growth on a foundation where people can participate. We are trying to do something actually which has not been done anywhere in the world, which is without with bypassing the space of public funded healthcare and education of good quality for all. And you know, Michael Weiner is somebody who who's looked at our school system and he says, why are our government schools so bad? It might be you might say it's corrupt governments, they corrupt corrupt governments everywhere. It is a cultural framework. Where once government schools are only for the children of the poor, we don't care what happens in them. So there is, I think, a larger social and cultural context in which we believe that the children of the poor deserve a very different set of entitlements than our children. Uh, we, no, you're shaking your head, but then then you should seek to okay. you should seek to be uh, taxed. Sufficiently to be able to ensure a common school system of high quality where the children of the poor get the same kind of education as you know. Okay, one second. One second. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, a it's, it's, it's a lack of trust. It's not about it. It's a lack of trust in the system. Yeah. So I'm just going to let them jump in here. One second. One second. We're not attacking it. Hold on. One by one. Okay. Secondly, the couple of key takeaways. I think we're missing the point of what he's trying to say here. And I want to just differentiate this argument from just purely about money. There is a basic problem of empathy, right? And I know that some of you have responded saying, no, we do care. 
But obviously, it's not filtering down to the level that it's making a difference. It's, and that doesn't mean that you're not doing enough individually. It means as a society. And I think the bigger question here is, what can the private sector do? We cannot fix the government. We cannot go and tell them how to do things. We all understand there are problems. The bigger question is, how can we influence it in whatever way that we can? And I'm going to get Harsha's answer to that in a moment, because he has addressed this in his book, which you will all read later on tonight. But I just also want to get another question from the gentleman at the back, who's hopefully not going to be yeah. as argumentative. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ashish, isn't one of the problems, at least yeah. with India, that, I mean, you, you spoke about the example about Mr. Gravy. Even when I was a kid, you now, you would, I mean, 400, 500 million people more now than we were at the time. And we're growing at 20 million people a year, 29 million people a year. And, you know, there is empathy, but it's just the problem's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it bigger. is getting bigger. And so, I mean, I'm not sure if it's a question of I mean, do we lack, I mean, I mean, yes, okay, people are looking away, but do we lack empathy today compared to maybe our, our forefathers or whatever? But it's just a question of look, the problem's getting bigger. The guys who are at the top don't have the skill set to solve it, you know. And to be honest, you know, I, I really don't know why there isn't a revolt in the country in the cities, you know. So it's like we're getting to that point. Yeah, uh, on, on the question of population, and as it take us into a different conversation, but I just want to leave a thought with you. I think all over the world, the experience is that we long believe that large families cause poverty. I think the increasing understanding is that poverty causes large families. And as households improve in their uh, you know, uh, 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 economic levels and in, in their education, families will become small. And I think we're looking at it from the, perhaps from the wrong end of the telescope. But that's, that's, that's one, uh, one point. To the, to the larger question that, that, that you know, we talked about uh, state's failures, uh, what the state fails in programs for the poor, but it fails in many other things as well. Yeah? So, for instance, there are the state fails in defense fields. Yeah? There's corruption, huge corruption in defense fields. But nobody says, let's stop all armament purchase till we've sorted this problem out. Yeah? Or the state, uh, you know, the building of infrastructure, the urban infrastructure, all of, of the things that we participate in. The state does, and, and corruption is a problem, but it is not a problem that we will only use to veto programs for the poor. Just think about, about that. I think there's a selectivity in, in, in how we use that argument. Of course, corruption is a problem. But corruption is a problem across the board, which needs to be four. Uh, but, but, but the larger, you know, the larger point that I'm trying to make is you, if you feel that, that we are an empathetic society, then everything that I'm saying breaks down. My belief is that uh, as a society, we are caring less and less and less about completely intolerable lives for people who surround us. And let me just give you one or two examples. Uh, again, I'm, I'm using the homeless only as an example. I talk about many other things in my book, but these are people we see every day. So, you know, very often we hear about some drunken bloke who, you know, in, in the night sort of drives over a set of homeless people. It happened, you know, in one of the shelters that we were running, it happened just outside it, and it sort of it hit, hit home a little bit more closely. But when people were run over, I, you know, sitting down and trying to understand who they were, firstly, they are people who come into the city largely to support their families who are starving back at the beginning. And this, they have no, this, we don't have public funded housing, which is there in most parts of the world for, for, for workers. There is absolutely no, nothing like social housing there. Uh, we don't have soup kitchens uh, where people, you know, would be able to get affordable food, which is there in most parts of the world. So, Empathetic India doesn't seem to find it necessary to provide all of these. So what ends up, what does that homeless person end up doing? He ends up in, he earns, you know, picking rags or, or, or the driving a rickshaw or on a construction site, he earns maybe about 130, 140 rupees a day. About 70 to 80 rupees of it he has to spend on just buying food to keep himself alive. 
it is you know every time you go to the toilet you have to pay every time you have to, you want to have a bath you have to pay there's so little left over and he has to save that so that he can send something home to keep his family alive but the question is a little more complicated than that because you might have noticed that homeless people especially in the rainy seasons etc sleep very close to the traffic islands or to the edge of the uh, you know, near the edge of the highway, where there is the greatest chance of them getting run over. So I wondered why. You know, asking them, the answer was actually quite simple. The answer was mosquitoes. They said that it is impossible to sleep with the mosquitoes when you're, you know, sleeping in the open. And they've learned that automobile fuels drive away uh, mosquitoes. And therefore, you have to sleep as close to where cars drive, so that their fumes drive away mosquitoes. Now, what we are saying is that in order to have a few hours of not great sleep, you know, the most minimal kind of sleep that you would be getting there, you have to A, destroy your lungs forever, and B, uh, uh, you, have to, uh, uh, you have to risk some joke running over you. This is the degree of inequality that we have normalized. We see it every day. The solutions are not complicated, but the social solutions require public investments. And I, I think that our outrage has to be, if you feel the empathy, if you feel that human being deserves no, no, uh, no less of a life than, 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 uh, than you and I have, then you have to demand that at least what is basically and, but what, how do we actually react? Let me give an, an example. The, the Right to Education Act had one very modest requirement that in elite schools, 25% of seats in class one would be reserved for uh, children of disadvantage. What happened? The schools all banded together. They collected a uh, huge amount of money. They employed the country's most expensive set of, of lawyers to challenge that and to and to, uh, and to uh, in the Supreme Court, they fought a very long case and it was, they were finally defeated. But what 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 were the arguments that they gave? Uh, the arguments that they gave were strikingly similar to me to the arguments that were given in the 1960s in the civil rights movement in the U.S. Almost I mean, see that was a moment of desegregation, but that was legal desegregation. But our schools are also segregated because the poor don't have place in them. And, and, and what were the arguments that they gave? A, they said the merit of our schools will get destroyed by getting the poor in, which means that genetically you and I have all the uh, all the merit, and the children of the poor don't. They said the second argument they gave was that the children of the poor will not be able to adjust in our schools. You know, exactly the same that they said about black children. Both of these were said, and and the answer there again is that. Uh, why should the burden be only for the for the children of the poor to adjust? Why can't our children adjust and learn to adjust? And, and, uh, uh, and you know, there's some people, Sister Cyril, who opened up a school in Calcutta for, for, for street children under great opposition. And she tells that how she taught the girl. She found, for instance, that uh, the, the girls uh, were very unused to wearing footwear. So she changed the uniform and said, up to class six, all girls will not wear footwear. They leave their footwear outside. So those girls are just it. And why should they not? Uh, and, 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 and you create inclusive cases. But so, so the second argument was, A, the merit of the schools will be destroyed if, if the children of the poor come in. The second is that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that these children won't be able to adjust. And the third is that it's not the job of business. Why the government should provide good schools, uh, as if you know, selling soap and selling education are, are, are the same thing. I mean that there is a, a public responsibility. So I have a feeling that and uh, I am Ahmedabad has set up a cell to actually track what is happening to these children once uh, once they enter in these schools. And the stories are horrific. The stories are horrific about how shabbily these children are treated. Uh, in many of these schools, uh, and they bring down their reports. So, so I don't. I mean, I see. Uh, I don't see a, a framework of public empathy informing how uh, we regard 
the children uh, of, uh, of the poor and what kind of lives they have to be. You know, we talk about youth, we talk about our, you know, our own children, uh, my own daughter is growing up. Do you, do you recall what is an aspirational youth today? Do you know how many children actually end up completing college, any kind of college? 7%. And how many, you know, with girls it's about 4%, in rural areas it's about 2%. What is the life that is open to other young people in our country? Of our growing up like our children? No different. Age of 16, you're likely to be married. Age of 18, you're likely to have two children. If you're a girl, you're likely to be defecating in the open, you're likely to you know, you know, uh, have no menstrual protection, you're likely to have nothing to look forward in the future. If you're a boy, by that age of 16, 18, you would become almost the primary breadwinner because your father has led such a sort of difficult life, you know, going from city to city trying to earn his living. So you go off to Punjab and to fields, etc. This is, I'm please recognize that this is the India of overwhelmingly large majority of people. I believe, you know, I spent my life thinking about a just and caring state and you might agree that these laws and policies don't make sense, etc, etc. But I, you know, what, what I argue in my book is that a just and caring state ultimately can only be located in a just and caring society. And unless you cannot feel, I, I don't expect any of us to feel the same pain when you see a child sleeping on the streets as you do with, with your own. But at least feel a fraction of that pain, feel distressed, feel this is unacceptable, make demands uh, on, on, you know, on yourself, on your government, on the schools around that they do something about this too. Actually, we're going we're, we're to need to pack in a few questions. I'm just going to. Uh, um, Speed it up a little bit. Yeah, so um, uh, Sandeep, and I know we have someone at the back as well. Sandeep. Okay. Um, it's important. Thanks. So, um, just a water. Yeah, I think it's uh, you've self selected here for an empathetic tax paying group. I'm sure you're faced with these that's issues. It's uh, important to have on this side. But I, I guess my question is look, this group here okay. is is on that other side saying, look, yeah, we get the problem, we're here, we're listening, we're more into stuff. I guess, doesn't it seem like a more manageable task to get the government to start to do something positive with the contributions that are being made, thereby having some sort of positive reinforcement from the system, as opposed to saying, listen, there's this mass of people that are unempathetic, and the only way to get them is to, I mean, these stories are very disturbing and, 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 and it's not, doesn't make anyone feel good. But like you said, you see it every day and you look away. So instead, if, if, if I saw something positive happen, you mentioned we've all succeeded. Absolutely. I, my road is never going to change. It's going to be a mess. I can only imagine it's going to get worse. I have no expectation of anything. So we blindly pay our taxes. We support Magic Bus and we hope that private uh, efforts will improve the situation. But if you started to see the system moving, don't you think that would unlock a little bit more of the empathy to believe that, okay, change can happen, and would our efforts be better spent changing that system to actually make our money uh, useful? No, I, I believe that the answers have to lie with the state. It has to be public. I mean, nowhere in the world you have uh, you know, private education uh, for the poor or private healthcare solving the problems of the poor. It has to be public funded, but it, it, we can we will make our government work if it is important for us. If it is as important, we have the same sense of outrage. We make the same demands uh, from our government. We, we are not making these demands. So if I if I say uh, so when, so when I say why should I be taxed to feed the poor? I'm saying something. No, actually, it's a populist government, right? So they win their votes over there, we pay the taxes here, and we say, please help do these things. And I think, A, A, we are paying far lower taxes than most comparable okay. populations across the world. Tax basis, though. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's Three percent. Our tax to GDP ratio may be low, but it's also because the tax basis was also. Well, so we have to buy. So, so, so precisely. So I'm saying the, uh, the, the, the who is in this? Who is not paying taxes? Are people who should be paying taxes? Right. 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 Yeah, but the guy yeah. in the driver's seat who has the money yes. is, is is not caring about the guy who's. I think the biggest issue is large farmers. I mean, you have farming income, farm income which is the biggest issue. It's one of the certainly farming needs, but it's big corporate uh, uh, houses. Well, I'll give you the example of, of the small car uh, factory in, 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 in Gujarat. That is the way subsidies are going in our country because we do, and it's based, they, I'm not saying this is Tony Capital, I'm not claiming that. I'm saying it is built on a, on a belief that states cannot deliver. This is a legitimate belief, and many of you are. Uh, so states are not delivered, let markets do it. It, it is the belief. Now, let us take the years 2004 to 2010, which were the years of highest economic growth in our country. How many jobs were created? Do you know? The total number of jobs that were created over the six years of very high economic growth in our country were about 3 million. The number of people just added to our workforce in those six years was about 57 million, uh, let alone the people there. So this economic growth model may be creating wealth, it certainly is, but it is not creating jobs. And most of the jobs, even these two million jobs, are largely in the in the in the, uh, in the uh, informal contract and, and so what, what I'm trying to argue is that it's not this we're not having an ideological discussion, we're having an empirical discussion. And even people like the IMF and all are saying that we are recognizing that without public funded healthcare and education, the poor will never be able to uh, change their destinies. And we are not making those investments. And to make those investments, we have to stop subsidizing the rich and we have to start taxing the rich. And we have to be saying that this is what the country should do. So, so I just want to, I want, I just, yeah, I just want to, I just want to wrap this up by, I, I, I think the general sense here is is pretty clear, and I think they get your point, Harsh. But I think when it comes down to the brass tacks, I think what everyone in this room would want to know is when I walk away from here today, what do I do? What do I do? I already pay my taxes, for example. I already pay my taxes. I do care. What else do I do? PSR initiatives. Right. Exactly. That are mandated by the government. Right. So, I mean, and, or is that, I mean, is that enough to have engaged in this discussion today and just, you know, under so that there's a problem? I, I know Oracle here, and I might be completely wrong in everything that I'm saying. Uh, I'm just trying to hold up a mirror and say, this is the society we built. Is, our, is the degree of our outrage, is the degree of our pain at the pain and the injustice that other people, the two million people dying preventable causes with just seven percent of young people even being able to aspire for a better life is that a satisfactory situation uh, are we doing enough do we care enough are we making enough demand is something that you have to decide not something that I can decide yeah, yeah? So, certainly but talking about I mean let me just you know go, go from see we are having a debate about the kind of state we we should have. And many of you still believe that a, a state which is, you know, which is strong, which makes large public investments, is not going to solve shopping. And there's a very strong, and I keep repeating, there's a very strong body of opinion. Uh, you know, the whole Jatish Bhagavati versus Amartya Sen discussion was precisely this. Amartya Sen was saying you have to have public health and education before we can have sustainable economic growth. Jatish Bhagavati says, let growth happen, people will buy their health and education. Uh, let the state not come in, it, it can't be there. This is a legitimate discussion and you can take a position on it. Uh, I have a position, but let's get down to something more, more basic, as you're saying, at the individual level. And the individual level, uh, what should you do? I feel, think about the conversations we have with young people. With the conversations we have around the bank, the conversations we have when we look at suffering and injustice around us. What, how is it that we engage with it? How are we, what are we telling our young, uh, our young people about it? And talking about giving, I mean, I just thought I'd leave you with two or three stories. Because I found 
in proportionate terms, but even in absolute terms. The giving of the very poor hugely out, uh, outweighs anything that I've seen in people. And I, I've done this often, in fact, as if India and Bill Gates, when they had, uh, you know, they tried to have this call once a year, they call some of the richest people. I was invited uh, in the secular source gathering, they called one of the people who aren't rich to also speak there. And uh, I was there, I've, I've met, I've had these interactions. And I've seen, I, I have great respect for what people like Azim Kendi do uh, and so on. But let me tell you some other stories, just two or three. Uh, perhaps we'll illustrate what, what I'd like to say. First, let's talk about the homeless incident. I, uh, you know, one of the things that happens on winter nights, uh, it goes down to more freezing temperatures, is that you have to hire blankets. Because a homeless person can't carry around your blankets. You, know, you uh, so you have no place, you have no place to store it. So, so every night if you need blankets, you have to hire them. It costs about 30 rupees, and they're entrepreneurs out, out in the city. And I see people making a decision, you know, uh, whether they have their evening meal or or, 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 or higher blankets, etc. But one day when, I was, when all this was happening, it suddenly occurred to me that among the homeless, you also have very old people, ailing people, people who would die uh, in a single night if they didn't have uh, something to cover themselves. I thought all of them had blankets. So I was curious. I said, how does this happen? And the homeless people told me very matter of fact. They said, but we know that these people would die in a single night. So when we all gather in the evenings, uh, we first all pool money to hire blankets for the old and the destitute among the homeless. Then if there's something left, we talk about what we have to do for ourselves. And they said it very matter of factly. I began to think that what government should be doing is not doing, what NGO should be doing, what the entrepreneurs should be doing. It's the poorest of the poor who are doing it and feeling that there is no other way. I mean, how could we not do it? Right? Uh, in Gujarat, I got involved a lot with the survivors of the right, victims. And uh, uh, I heard about, you know, the one story about Gujarat which is not told is not about, you know, for every story of brutality, I have found at least three to four stories of people who saved lives. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that's really the untold story uh, as well. And so I heard about this village where there were 110 Muslims, and they said that uh, this man had kept them uh, for 10 days and 10 nights. So I'd imagine this very rich landlord, etc. I said I'd try to go and see him. When I went to see him, I found he was a small farmer, uh, just a few acres of land. And uh, the story the Muslims only told me that when everything, you know, the houses were set on fire, they all ran, and they hid in the fields. Uh, and at night it became very cold, and they were wondering what to do, and the children were hungry, and they knew this man was compassionate. So they went to his door and said, Can you keep us for one night? And he said, Not one night, I will keep you for as long as you need it. And so he had them, uh, you know, he they have a whole store of grain for the years, they opened out, he collected his entire set of men folk in his. Extended family, they kept guard for two, ten days and ten nights, uh, the women were kept making food, uh, and, and so on. And, and uh, so when I was talking to him about this, uh, he was very embarrassed that, he, that I thought that he'd done something extraordinary. So he said, uh, uh, I said, why did you do this? And he said, uh, how could I bear it if people of my village are treated this way. This village belongs to Muslims as much as it belongs to me. And I long to hear with the same conviction uh, uh, in my middle class friends to say this country belongs to Muslims as much as it belongs to me. Then I, the second question I asked them, you must have at least been frightened because they then set fire to these fields. Uh, uh, they said, anyway. So his wife got irritated with that question. She said, when you're doing the right thing, how can you be frightened? Uh, so I said, okay. I said, at least you must be sorry that you know this entire store of your years green has, has, has got, lost, uh, got finished in those 10 days. And she said, uh, he said, no, God worshipped me, uh, God rewarded me and ensured that my dreams were never empty. And I felt that, you know, he was sure that his, he had no confusion that his Thakurji would, uh, would reward him for saving 110 Muslim lives. 
uh, and uh, and so on. I don't know where we get our conclusions. Uh, but the last story, and I'll just finish with that, uh, was again in, in Juhapara, where you know, it's a place where a lot of people were displaced and are living in these in this ghetto with one room tenements, etc. So my colleagues were with, uh, with this woman who had lost most of her family and she was destitute and she was living in this place. A, a, a fakir came, a fakir is a Muslim beggar, and he put out his hand. She went in and she took out five rupees. And then she brought it out and she gave it to him. When he left, she started weeping. And she was not able, I mean, she was completely uh, you know, inconsolable. And uh, they thought we've said something that has caused her anguish. And finally, uh, she, uh, you know, she said, before the, they, she, they call it the Tufa and the storm, before the storm, if this man had come to me, I would have given him no less than 50 rupees, and I would have seated him down, and I would have given him a meal, and only then would I have let him go. Look at what has become of me, all I could give him was five rupees. And I felt that she understood something that her sense of, of greatest loss was not that she lost her home and her family and everything, she lost her capacity to give. I, I think we have standards to measure ourselves against. Even if you're not thinking of the larger society, let's measure ourselves against the standards set by these species. Fantastic note to end on. Harsh, uh, thank you so much for sharing those stories with us today. It was a real privilege to have you here in this intimate gathering and thank you all for participating and I'm sure you have more questions but I think we're now going to wrap up and open up the house so you can have a few more drinks and discuss over that. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much Harsh. Harsh is really today to interview us. Thank you very much for coming down Harsh. It's really good thought provoking conversation. We have uh, some cow sway coming, we have some more wine, some dry lemon to get away so that's completely good as well. So. And we'll let you know when the next one is. So, we'll see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, by the way, sorry, everyone has a copy of a signed copy of the book as well. So, we need to take away with you.